the financial centers of the world. This is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, Wednesday, December 1st. Happy December. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. It's a buy-the-tip day just with some more volatility. Stocks bounce, yields rise, oil pops. It's day two of Jay Powell and Janet Yellen's testimony on Capitol Hill. And Dudley says accelerate the taper. We're going to speak to the former New York uh, Fed president after he warns that it will be too late if the Fed doesn't speed up its taper in December. And... Omicron concerns. The variant pops everywhere as countries tighten travel rules. And Germany uh, talks about potentially a mandatory vaccine. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And speaking of those tighter uh, rules in terms of travel, Guy, you were just at an aviation conference. What was your biggest takeaway? So my biggest takeaway is short term, yes, there is an impact. Short term, that impact is manifesting itself in Europe. There is some impact in the North Atlantic, but most of it is in Europe right mm. now. I talked to uh, a bunch of U.S. CEOs. I, at the moment, they don't see any effects. Uh, Thanksgiving was really strong. They expect Christmas to be strong. Uh, so it feels, from an aviation point of view at the moment, to be a very European problem, Alex. Yeah, I just wonder if we're, again, six weeks behind you guys. So it's a European problem. Is it going to be our problem right after the holidays? I don't know. We'll wait. We'll watch. We'll see. But the sense at the moment is that the, the issue is, is actually less Omicron and more Delta. That's certainly mm. the problem here in Europe. Uh, but we are starting to certainly see more cases popping up. I, I'm waiting to see what the U.S. does. The expectation, certainly amongst those I talked to this morning, was that while we're not likely to see the, the transatlantic shutting down, we may see increased testing rules. Yeah, that's what I was worried, we'll the see. transatlantic route. Yeah, absolutely. You should have come yeah. before. That's all I'm going to say. That's the expectation. Let's talk about the data. Let's get back to what is happening with the economy and focus on what is going on there. We're getting the ISM manufacturing data out. 61.1, uh, bang in line with expectations. 61.2, the expectation. Up, though, from 60.8. That's the headline number. Let's break it down. Price is paid, 82.4. That drops a little bit. So maybe we're starting to see some evidence that we are seeing uh, some of those supply chain issues beginning to get tamped down a little bit. The expectation there was for 85. New orders, 61.5. The employment component rises to 53.3. So some of those um, unfilled jobs, some of that struggle that industry is having to fill positions at the moment, maybe we're starting to see uh, some evidence uh, of that moving a little bit as well. Let's get a breakdown on the ISM numbers. Tim Fiore puts them together. Uh, he is ISM's Business Survey Committee Chair. Tim, what should I read into this data? Oh, good morning. So we had another really good month, of course, and you know, the interesting thing is, though, is that the dynamics that make up the PMI did shift a little bit, and they moved closer to equilibrium. And, and what I mean is really that the, uh, the supplier chain issues eased a bit, uh, but it was offset by gains on production and employment. So, and that's really where we want to go. The, the input side has been super strong, driving the number up. We really need more output. And I think the month of November saw us make, make gains on that. So... That's in some ways a little more backward looking. It might encompass Delta, but not Omicron. Do you have an idea of what these numbers are going to look like in a month? Well, I think we're going to continue to you know, exceed expectations. The demand levels are still really high. We rebounded from the month of October where we eased a little bit. We're now back over 60. The backlog numbers are still extremely high over 60. Customer inventories are at record lows. Export le levels did pretty good. Uh, there seems to be uh, some gains here now on the employment side, which is what we've all been waiting for. So 7% uh, of my employment comments indicated that things were getting better in November, up from 5% in October, 3% in September, and 0% in August. So I think we have a trend there. It's a positive trend. Uh, it's not overwhelming, but it really just indicates that it's going to be a climb out here to really fully staff the factories as well as the supply base. But Overall, you know, we, we had a really good move, I think, uh, having inputs uh, ease a little bit, offset by the uh, consumption side. Uh, and then, you know, the final comment here is that the transportation sector is still restricted, uh, still had very high level of comments on transportation uh, disruptions, 50% or so of my comments were transportation related. Looking to see that ease a little bit, but I don't want to see it ease too much because we're performing really well. The, the chair of the Federal Reserve yesterday retired the word transitory. 
If you were to think about a word to describe what you're seeing right now in terms of the inflation impulse that you're getting through your data, what would it be? Well, you know, I think we are in a cycle here. Uh, you, you did note that uh, the prices index did uh, soften a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, which is good. At the same time, the supplier delivery number softened a little bit, which is good again. Uh, you know, we ran up some really high peaks here. You know, steel's running somewhere around two thousand dollars a short ton only a, f a couple of months ago. Now down to seventeen fifty. That's a positive indicator. Uh, generally, runs six forty, six fifty. I don't know that we're ever going to get to that level again without something really not so good happening. But uh, it, it looks like we're kind of easing a little bit. I, I think the month of December will tell a lot. Hey, Tim, Crystal, ball it for me one more time here. Um, if we wind up having sort of issues with travel or something along those lines because of the new variant, I'm wondering if that expectation is more work from home, meaning buying more stuff, which means the backlog kind of continues and those inflationary pressures build. Any signs yet from you on that? Well, you know, the, the big indicator here is the import side. You know, the ports have still had trouble. We did come through the peak in November, October, November. We are now in the Lunar New Year uh, phase, and we are starting to negotiate the labor contracts on the West Coast. So looking to see those uh, those ports kind of free up a little bit. One of our number one industry sector is furniture, and they're a big importer, and there's been a lot of trouble for that, as everyone kind of knows. But you know, I, I think we're in a good position here. Even if uh, we have an issue with Omicron, I think the manufacturing economy will continue to perform well. And, and even you know, when the service side fully opens back up, uh, there's been you know, enough saved by Americans that I, mm -hmm. I think there's at least a six month carryover. And you know, the feelings right now within the industry is that this is gonna carry right through 2023. Wow, 20, okay, that's a long time. That's definitely not transitory. Good. All right, Tim. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, generally run seven, we, we generally run 35 to 36 month cycles on the manufacturing expansion. Right now we're 18 months. So there's still you know good good runway. Now this is not a typical expansion, mm -hmm. but then again, there's no reason to think it's going to uh, collapse either. So I, you know we're into 2023, I think. Tim, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next month. Love getting the instant analysis. Tim Fiore, ISM's Business Survey Committee Chair. Thank you very much. A guy was just talking about it. Fed Chair Jay Powell's testimony yesterday before the Senate Banking Committee was about two T's: tapering and transitory. Here's what he said about inflation. The test that we've articulated, I think, clearly has been met now. Uh, you know, you, you're absolutely right. Inflation has run well above 2% for long enough. The word transitory has different meanings to different people. I think it's, it's probably a good time to retire that, that uh, word and try to explain more clearly what we mean. Well, joining us now, Bill Dudley, Bloomberg Opinion columnist and senior advisor to Bloomberg Economics. And he wrote in a recent Bloomberg op-ed that, quote, the Fed should and probably will double the pace of tapering, setting a trajectory to the end of the asset purchase program by mid-March. And Bill joins us now. Bill, I'm assuming yesterday when you are listening to this testimony, it validated what you thought. This is a good thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Fed's very behind the curve. Uh, they're still adding monetary policy stimulus, even as the economy is overheating, uh, even as the supply of laborers are quite tight. So th they're behind the curve and they need to free up some space so they can actually have uh, greater optionality in terms of the timing of liftoff. And I, Chair Powell's testimony today said they're going to they're do that at this next FOC meeting. They'll accelerate the taper, finish it by mid-March. Uh, that means that the possibility of liftoff can start at the March meeting or, or, or somewhat, uh, somewhat later. Even then, would they still be behind the curve? We've still got another few months of stimulus being added to the economy. Bill, how, do, how does the Fed get in front of this inflation story? What does it need to do? Does it want to be in front of this inflation story? What's interesting about the market reaction is the markets are not acting like the Fed's behind the curve. If you look at the, uh, the peak federal funds rate that the market's expecting for this cycle, it's only about one and a half, one and three quarters percent. That's very inconsistent with what inflation is doing and, and how late the Fed is, is in responding to that, that inflation risk. So I think that you know, the market's gonna have to be significantly repriced at some point. Uh, the Fed will probably have to go you know, faster than what people expect. Uh, they'll probably have to go higher than what people expect. Hmm. Uh, and that's gonna be a bit of a shock to financial markets. Well, Bill, that's an interesting point, because when we were discussing this yesterday, it seemed like what the market was pricing in was uh, maybe more aggressive rate hikes, but uh, a, a lower terminal rate. They just don't last as long. They don't go as high, for example. Um, how unprepared do you feel like is the market for the scenario that you're outlining? I think it's very unprepared. I mean, as you pointed out yesterday, it wasn't about increasing the amount of tightening uh, built, built in by the Fed being more concerned about inflation. It was just pulling it forward. So there's more rate hikes priced into 2022 and the first half of 2023. 
but there's virtually nothing beyond the uh, you know, middle of 2023 and into 24, 25. And the terminal rate is really, really low. So I think there's still, you know, I think people are overestimating how easy it is going to be for the Fed to get inflation under control. The idea that the Fed tightens three, four times and all of a sudden inflation just melts away, I don't think that's how it's going to work. The Federal Reserve has to tighten sufficiently to, to essentially slow the economy uh, to prevent the economy from overheating. And so it's going to take more than what's priced in today to do that. Bill, we haven't had a credit cycle. Are we about to have one? I don't think we're going to have one really in the very near term because the Fed's still on hold for a while. Uh, the Fed is expected to tighten, you know, moderately over the next couple of years. And earnings growth is really, really strong right now. So I think the credit cycle is going to happen, but it's only going to happen when there's a realization that the Federal Reserve has to do quite a bit more. Uh, you know, even the Federal Reserve itself thinks that the peak in the cycle is going to be quite a bit higher than what markets mm. priced in. If you look at the summary of economic projections, they view a neutral short-term rate uh, with at 2% inflation as 2 to 3%. And inflation is well north of 2%. So if they're going to make monetary policy tight, they think that the rates are going to have to go well above two to three percent. Uh, so that's you know there's, there's a there's a disconnect between market expectations and what the Fed thinks and mm -hmm. what the Fed's going to have to do with respect to inflation. Yeah, and fair enough. I mean, I, I feel like the markets led the Fed for the last few years when it comes to this. Um, I want to get your take on what's happening with the long end of the curve. Today's a bit of, a bit different than yesterday, but when we saw sort of the front end rate really rise and the back end did not, and flatter, 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 the 530, for example, the flattest since March of 2020. Does this throw some cold water on the idea that the Fed is suppressing long-term rates? They have been not easing. They have been paring back some. They have been tightening those financial conditions, and yields haven't really moved. Well, I think the hard part to evaluate is the effects of, of the Fed's asset purchases at a time that the Treasury's borrowing needs have actually uh, fallen. So the Fed is taking out a lot of Treasuries from the market relative to the you know, net new supply. And so I think we're not really going to get a good sense of how where the Treasury market should actually perform in the longer end until the Fed essentially backs away from a quantitative easing. And that's still you know three or four months away. What is the current paradigm do you think that the Fed is operating with? We, we clearly probably have worked our way through a symmetrical inflation target. What comes next? Well, the paradigm that they've been operating with is the idea that uh, you know, we have trouble pushing inflation up to 2%. Therefore, we have to probe the limits of maximum sustainable employment. And it turns out that was the problem of the last cycle. But that's definitely not the problem of this cycle, because they're missing badly on their inflation objective currently even as they still think there's some slack left in, in the U.S. labor market. So the regime that they put in place is just ill-suited for the current set of circumstances. Um, something that's been happening that has been quite strange is that the job market continues to be really solid and job openings are plentiful and consumer confidence keeps rolling over. Do, is, is inflation to explain for that? What is the biggest issue? I think inflation is absolutely what's uh, okay. how you would explain it. Uh, otherwise, it makes makes little sense. Why would confidence be going down as the economy is recovering and the job markets are really robust? It's got to be because higher inflation is crimping people's uh, disposable income, and they're feeling the strain of you know buying gasoline, buying groceries. If things are much more expensive than they were a year ago. Bill, what is your global perspective on what is happening here? Is is inflation a U.S. problem? Is it, a, is it a, a Eurozone problem? Is it going to be a problem in Japan? Because if the latter two don't see the same issues that the Fed sees, then they are going to act as a, as a kind of counterpoint to the liquidity squeeze that the Fed is going to put on. We could potentially see the ECB and the BOJ countering that. I appreciate that globally liquidity will still fall, but nevertheless, we're still going to have two major providers in the market. So far, Europe is following the U.S. just not quite as severely in terms of the amount of inflation pressure, but inflation has gone up quite su substantially in Europe as well. A uh, little bit less, you know, supply disruptions because they didn't lay off a lot of workers when the pandemic hit, and so they haven't the companies haven't had to scramble so hard to get their workforce back in, in place. And in Japan, we're they're, they're not seeing much inflation at all, so the, Japan is still in a very different place than the, than the rest of the world, and that's been the case for for several decades now. 
Hey, Bill, before we let you go, um, Jay Powell yesterday made it very clear, like, the next two weeks of data is going to be super important. You got the CPI, you have the jobs number Friday, you also have uh, the case count if we see any rise here in the U.S. with Omicron. And I wonder, what's the number one thing you're going to be reading between the lines? Well, I don't think the economic data is going to dissuade the Fed in terms of what they do at the next meeting. We know the labor market's strong. Uh, we know we have an inflation problem, regardless of what the next payroll employment report looks like or what the next uh, consumer price index report looks like. The big wild card, of course, is the new variant, Omicron. And if that turns out to be, you know, very severe, you know, ter term very contagious and very, you know, severe outcomes in terms of people who get sick, you know, could that affect the Fed's decision making? Yeah, it could. But I think, as, as Jay Paul made, made clear yesterday, uh, even if the variant turns out to be bad, it, it has demand effects, but also has supply effects. And it's not clear that the, the, the demand effects would be more important than the supply effects. So I think that you know, you're pretty locked in for acceleration of the taper at the next FOMC meeting two weeks from now. Bill, Bill, really enjoyed the piece this morning. Incredibly timely. Really enjoyed our conversation. Bill Dudley. Bloomberg Opinion columnist and Bloomberg Economics Senior Advisor, of course, formerly of the New York Fed. Uh, tune in to an exclusive interview we're going to have a little bit later on. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester uh, will be on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia a little later on. That's going to be 6 p.m. New York time. What have we got coming up for you? Stocks, as Alex indicated at the top, bouncing back. Steep sell-offs uh, obviously dominating the last few days. Our next guest, though, says don't aggressively buy the dip. Well, not yet. Mira Pandit, JP Morgan Asset Management, global market strategist, joining us next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Taking a look at the equity markets, incredibly well bid. Obviously, on a five-day basis, still down. But today, we are certainly catching a bid when it comes to stocks. As you can see, uh, we are tracking a little bit higher. Uh, keep an eye on, obviously, what is going on in the bond market. The ongoing repricing uh, is something you definitely want to pay attention to. Uh, the U.S. two-year, as you can see, on offer today. The dollar on offer. Crude coming back. Wow, what a ride it has been. We're now trading at 68.49. So, strong kind of move from equities does seem to be based on the economic data. Uh, and if you look back on the, uh, the past 31 years, trade and, traders would often say that Tina uh, when it comes to US equities. What does that mean? Uh, there is no alternative. Just like over the past 31 years at Bloomberg, there has been no alternative when it comes to making a decision about our next guest. He's a must-have. There is no alternative. Bloomberg's Dave Wilson. That's your new tagline. Over to you. Thank you, Guy. Yeah, I mean, think of the uh, chart I, I put out today as sort of a career summation. Going back mm -hmm. to October 1990 when I started here and just doing sort of a basic comparison of market performance. U.S. stocks, international stocks, U.S. bonds, international bonds, money markets, commodities. And I got to tell you, when you see the results, it's clear why Tina is something that people have been talking about for years. The Russell 3000 index on a total return basis, so you're including dividends in that, uh, at one point last month, up 30-fold from where it was in October 1990. Four times the gain we saw in an MSCI index that tracks uh, markets outside the U.S. on a dollar-denominated basis, and then you find bonds behind them, you know, money markets based on Ryan Labs, you know, U.S. Uh, cash index behind them, and then finally commodities. You know, it just goes to show you, you know, how much U.S. stocks have really been dominant when it comes to performance over the past 30 plus years. I mean, it just it, it jumps out, and it, it really does kind of make clear why, for many people, there is no alternative to U.S. stocks here. And there's no alternative for you either, Dave. Um, listen, thanks a lot. And as you mentioned, you've been here 31 years uh, at Bloomberg, and Dave is retiring. Your dedication to Bloomberg is greatly appreciated, and we hope that you enjoy your life in retirement as much as we enjoyed you. How long do you get bored? Uh, well, I'm going to try very hard not to. I mean, I'm involved with my undergraduate alma mater, Monmouth University, and my church, so that's sort of a starting point. But the beauty of it is I have time to figure out the rest. You know, yes. My career has been pretty much 
uninterrupted. Started a little paper in South Jersey, then went to Dow Jones, then came here to Bloomberg. Not much of a break, so it'll be nice to sort of have the opportunity to kind of reflect, figure out what's next. Well, we look forward to seeing uh, what that's going to be, Dave. Thanks a lot. We appreciate you and we appreciate you coming on as well. Guy? The opportunity of being bored sounds actually quite nice to me. Uh, but we'll park that thought for a moment, maybe for a few years. Um, let's talk about what is going on right now. Yesterday, we didn't know we were going to get such amazing breaking news from the hearing uh, with Jay Powell and Janet Yellen. The Fed Chair Jerome Powell and the Treasury Secretary are back on, uh, back on Capitol Hill. Uh, they are preparing to face questions. This is obviously the second time that we're seeing this. Now, in the old days... Alan Greenspan might just finesse the message. Um, they're testifying before the House Financial Services Committee uh, on the pandemic response. Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Mike McKee joins us now to discuss. Mike, as I say, I, in the olden days, Greenspan would kind of see what the market reaction was to day one and then kind of finesse the message on day two. Do you think there's any finessing of the message that needs to happen here? No, I don't think so. Um, you talk about the olden days with Dave and me here. You're still here, though. Uh, it, yeah, I'm still <laughs> here. You still got to put some kids through college. <laughs> well, uh, the, in, in the Greenspan days, of course, the Fed was not nearly as transparent as it is. And over the years, we've evolved into this uh, sort of pattern where the Fed hints at strongly enough what they're going to do that the markets can absorb that. Without, the Fed doesn't make a promise and say this is exactly what is going to happen, but uh, they say basically we think this would be a good idea or we're going to talk about this, and then everybody can reprice without having a shock in the markets and without having uh, what we saw in the taper tantrum, and that was because Ben Bernanke surprised the markets with his comments. So I think Jay Powell did a good do job yesterday of basically saying the market's right, uh, you think we should taper faster, and we're probably going to do that. And he held up the one finger and said, except we don't know what's going to happen with uh, Omicron. All right, Mike, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. No, you got to run, too. Bloomberg's Michael McKee joining us there. All right, let's get some market reaction before we get uh, to Fed Chair Jay Powell and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. We're joined now by Mira Pandit, uh, J.P. Morgan Asset Management and Global Market Strategist. Mira, what is the trade after yesterday? Well, markets don't like uncertainty, and certainly there's a lot of uncertainty with the virus right now, a lot of unanswered questions. So what we're likely to see is some choppiness in markets going forward over the next couple of weeks until we get some answers to those unanswered questions. But right now, we wouldn't necessarily advocate for huge shifts in portfolios. Uh, we're not necessarily going to aggressively buy the dip, but at the same time, it's still a pretty favorable backdrop for stocks, all things considered. And we've dealt with the virus in various surges before. So in that respect, we still, you know, for those more concerned about the virus and, and where we go from here, areas like technology, healthcare have tended to be good ports during the storm over the last two years. But equally, if we think beyond just the next few weeks of uncertainty to the next few months, with rates as low as they are, they're likely going to be on the rise again. Growth is still in a pretty solid place and inflation is high. So we don't necessarily want to give up on some of those cyclical areas of the market either. Yeah, it feels, Mira, that you've got two different forces at work here that may be slightly pulling in different directions. You've got what is happening with Omicron, the Delta surge that we're seeing. That may encourage some of the stay-at-home stocks to come to the fore. It may encourage people uh, to continue to hold technology stocks. The, the, the re-rating of the taper and the rate hiking cycle feels like it is also quite opaque at the moment. What is your sense of how the journey to clarity is going to go? Um, we don't know what rate they're going to be tapering at. We don't know uh, what the first rate hike is going to look like. We don't know how, rates, how high rates are ultimately going to go. H how do I kind of put these two things together? Well, Powell's comments yesterday implied that the Fed is more concerned at this point about inflation than potential impacts to growth or jobs from this variant. And in some ways, that is surprising in the broader context of how accommodative and patient the Fed has been in particular in recent years, even if we go back to 2019 and think about some of the rate cuts in that environment. So this is certainly a shift and it, it does 
raise the stakes for the December meeting in terms of a potential acceleration of the tapering timeline. And, and the challenge we face there is on the, on the one hand, from a market's perspective, that does give the Fed a bit more flexibility in terms of liftoff. On the other hand, until we see that happen, there could be quite a bit of interest rate volatility as markets try to time when that liftoff will be. But I don't think we should get ahead of ourselves on liftoff either. Again, the key is buying that flexibility. And where we are economically today could be very different in the middle of next year when growth mm -hmm. is slowing, consumer demand is potentially waning, inflation is starting to break. So the Fed's going to have to make decisions based on the future economy, not the present state of the economy today. Mira, under what conditions do you think that the Fed could actually get the real rate towards zero? And if they were successful in that, where do you think we'd see the biggest asset repricing? It's a real challenge. And I think there's a lot of question about what that terminal rate would be at the end of this cycle and, and at what pace we're going to potentially see hikes. I mean, certainly with the accommodation we've seen from a monetary perspective and additionally from a fiscal perspective, it puts us in a different place even than last cycle in terms of not only rates or inflation. Um, so we're going to have to be um, increasingly cognizant of how this environment shifts. But the challenge we also face today is that stock valuations are high, bond valuations are high. There are certainly some constraints going forward in terms of where returns are going to go. So investors are really going to have to look globally, look in both public and private markets and be well diversified to navigate um, a very different economic environment going forward. Mira, stay there. We need to carry on the conversation. We'd like you to be part of it. Uh, let's bring another voice into the discussion, though. Bloomberg's Vince Signorella joining us now. Um, Vince, how should I think about the Fed puts how should I think about asset valuations with reduced liquidity? What is your current assessment? I think what, uh, what you need to look at, and I think um, what Powell said yesterday was a significant change of how the Fed is now looking at economic data. Prior to yesterday, the Fed had always concentrated pretty much on jobs and saying jobs had to need to be returned to that pre-pandemic level before the Fed would actually really move. I mean, we, we know we're going to get taper, but that doesn't mean the Fed's still not going to be accommodative. Yesterday, he essentially said that uh, jobs are not going to return to pre-pandemic, that they've been looking at that a little bit incorrectly, and that the jobs uh, data that they were going to get um, is going to take far longer than they originally thought to get it back to the pre-pandemic levels. He then shifted the conversation to inflation, and that inflation is going to be obviously not transitory, removing the word, and being longer term. I think for asset valuations, what that means is there's, I think, a little bit of an underpricing in the long end of the curve. While mm -hmm. we are going to see the near end react a little bit more aggressively, obviously, because it's tied to the Fed funds rate, but uh, arguably, we're not going to see an inversion of the yield curve. So therefore, the entire curve needs to ratchet up, and I think the long end is well underpriced. So if that's the case, how much tightening needs to then be priced into the dollar in, in Vincent's former life? He's a well, he is a recovering FX trader, hence the no hair thing. Um, <laughs> what needs to be in the dollar now? I, I think the dollar is also underpriced. I know a lot of people look at it and people have been trying to sell the dollar since 2016 and have been getting burned for the better part of five years now, and I think they're going to get burned again next year. Um, that ratcheting up of the yield curve is going to make the dollar a little bit more uh, attractive than, for instance, say, uh, Europe, Europe or even the UK. While they may be looking to hike rates, the UK rate hikes were for actually very, very bad reasons in that they import a great deal of product uh, with the situation still ongoing with the EU and the I can't believe I'm saying this again, Brexit. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're, I know, their inflation situation is going to be a little bit more difficult uh, than the U.S. situation in terms of the bad kind of inflation. So I think overall, um, our overall positive for the dollar, and again, emerging markets as well. When you, when you see U.S. rates going up, a lot of EM debt is priced in dollar, on dollar debt, so quite negative for the, uh, the balance sheets of, of emerging market countries. Uh, and at the same time, um, you know, with this spread of the variant, it is obviously spreading in places that are having more difficulty getting the vaccine. And that's not a case, uh, for instance, in the United States. Mira, let me bring you back into the conversation. Mira Pandit of JP Morgan Asset Management. Um, if Vince is right and we're going to see a stronger dollar 
does that mean I'm best off putting my assets into the United States next year? Um, already, if you compare and contrast for a euro investor versus a dollar investor uh, in the S&P, it's a 10% difference in terms of the performance. If the dollar continues to strengthen, that will only widen. Should I favor U.S. stocks if we're going to get a, a stronger dollar? On a shorter term basis, we're seeing better growth within the U.S. I think that that is, is pretty clear across the, the world to everyone. But what I think we could see is, is a shift to a more global recovery. Now, the variant does throw a bit of a spanner in the works in that if we do see a, a surge within this new variant and globally, particularly in some of the less vaccinated areas, that could postpone or delay some of that global recovery. But I don't think it's going to derail it entirely. So I do think that we're going to gear portfolio portfolios uh, in a more international way in the mm -hmm. second half of next year. But right now, we are still seeing that U.S. growth continues to outpace international growth. That has helped prop up the dollar, along with some of these new concerns in which the dollar tends to be a safe haven. So for now, the U.S. is a good bet in terms of where investors are positioning. But I do think we're going to want to make sure that portfolios are more geared globally in nature into 2022. Yeah, Mira, do you think that they also need to be geared towards more cross-asset volatility? You're likely to see more volatility, not only because of the variant right now and what you're seeing within the equity markets, but also the, the taper timeline and how that will evolve, plus the timeline on terms of rate hikes is probably going to result in a decent amount of, of rate volatility with that uncertainty. And as we are in such a transition period for the economy and, and for monetary policy across the board, investors should be prepared for some degree of volatility next year despite the fact that the economic fundamentals are still pretty solid. It's just not necessarily going to continue to progress this recovery on, a, on an entirely linear path. Vince, if the Fed is going to remove the punch bowl or at least start to drain it, are we about to have a credit cycle? How many businesses have been able to survive this downturn because of the largesse of the Fed? Uh, there are some high-profile names that I can think of. Is that about to turn around? Is the credit cycle about to reassert itself? I think that's a, I think you hit it on the head a, a little bit. I think that's a real possibility. Um, we know we've seen many, many uh, IG issuances in, in this year where a, a great deal of corporations, not just in the US uh, and abroad, have taken advantage of low interest rates and, and trying to tie up um, uh, money uh, for the foreseeable future in expectation of this date. So I think a lot of companies have have taken the steps necessary uh, to protect against it. Uh, however, I, I think a lot of uh, the smaller businesses uh, don't have that that ability, and I think they're the ones that are probably going to suffer the most. So if we see a credit cycle fallout like that, is it like the last ones that we've seen, or is this time going to be different, Vincent? I don't think we're going to see uh, the financial stress pressors that we've seen in the past, because I, I think any moves by the Fed, I think, are going to be very, very gradual. And I think uh, the, the corporate world will be able to keep pace with it. Uh, it's going to be more expensive, obviously, but certainly not so expensive that it's going to, I think, crush anyone in particular. The Fed is not going to be doing the, you know, the 50 basis point uh, hikes of the Volcker era. They're going to kill us with a thousand cuts, the Greenspan era of 25 basis points at a time. And once <laughs> that cycle begins, I, you know, it, I don't think we're going to be in a situation that we've seen in the past where the Fed has made, you know, clearly made mistakes, where they've raised four times and then realized they, they raised too soon and then had to lower four times. This cycle looks like we're really at a 40-year a low or so in interest mm. rates, and that the next cycle is going to be considerably over time higher, but not necessarily in an exaggerated path, I think at a very slow sort of glacier speed, if you will. Hey, guys, really appreciate uh, the wind-up there. Thank you so much. Mira Pandit of J.P. Morgan Asset Management and Bloomberg's Vincent Signorella. You can check him out on the Bloomberg Audio Squawk, SQUA Go on the terminal. We're currently Fed Chair Jay Powell and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen are now taking questions from the members of the House Financial Services Committee. Maxine Waters is speaking now. Let's listen in. It builds a new, stronger, and more equitable economy for the future. So let's talk about the progress we're making. Chair Powell, the American Rescue Plan that passed in March helped accelerate vaccinations and reopenings over the last nine months. The economy was at, has added over 5.6 million jobs, and workers have started to see meaningful, meaningful rather, wage growth for the first time in decades. Do you view these wage growth trends as positive? 
How does your economic recovery compare with other major economies? And do you still think that inflation will be temporary? And if so, why? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So on, on wages, we have seen wages moving up significantly. And uh, at this point, uh, of course, we like to see wages move up. Everyone likes to see wages move up. That's how uh, incomes rise generation to generation. Uh, and so particularly at the lower end of the wage spectrum, we are seeing wages move up. Um, at this point, we don't see them moving up at a troubling rate that would, that would tend to spark higher inflation, but that's something we're watching very carefully. <clears throat> In terms of other uh, economies, our, econ our recovery is, is the strongest. It's stronger than the others. We've had, uh, um, we, we had stronger fiscal support, frankly, and, uh, and so part of, the, part of it is that. But uh, our, our recovery is really the, the farthest advanced of any of the largest ones. In terms of the, uh, the temporary nature of inflation, I would say that the inflation that we're seeing is still clearly connected to, uh, the reop to pandemic related factors. Um, I would also add, though, that it has spread more broadly in the economy, and I think that the risk of persistent higher inflation has clearly risen, and uh, I think that our policy has adapted to that and will continue to adapt. Um, if you could expound a little bit more on um, <clears throat> what is happening. I remember when we first started to talk about inflation, uh, we, we basically all talked about it in terms of it being transitory. And I think that um, what you just alluded to relative to how the economy um, will act or recover, um, are you directly talking about stimulating the economy uh, with, for example, build back better and that will help with the inflation uh, that we're experiencing? Well, I, I, I do think that, that forecasters at the Fed and, and around pretty much all forecasters do expect that inflation will move down over the second half of next year closer to our, uh, to our longer run goal of 2%. But as I mentioned, we've seen, we've, we've seen uh, inflation be more persistent. We've seen the factors that are causing higher inflation be more persistent. There I'm thinking of the combination of very high demand, but also the supply side difficulties that were happening with um, um, blockages and that sort of thing and shortages. Um, in terms of the, the effects of, uh, of, the, of the Build Back Better bill, that's not something that, that it's appropriate for me to comment on. Thank you. Secretary Yellen, when you were Fed chair, you were known for looking beyond the top line unemployment rate to other figures like the rate of employees quitting, the so-called quits rate, to determine whether the economy was reaching full employment. The quits rate has surpassed uh, previous records, leading some to label what has happened in the economy as the great resignation. When Chair Powell testified in our committee mm -hmm. in July, he identified child care and school closures as one of the biggest barriers to further labor market recovery. Can you explain what the quit, quit rate tells us about the economy today? And do you believe that the investments that the Build Back Better Act would make in child care and universal pre-K help with this? Well, the quit rate, um, when it is high, and as you mentioned, it's the highest it's been in the history of this series, it signifies a tight labor market, one where um, workers are leaving their jobs because they feel confident about their ability to get others, often are getting uh, outside offers, and um, feel good about the labor market, and that's what we have, and we see it reflected in surveys um, of workers who feel that jobs are plentiful. And of course, businesses almost universally complain now about the difficulty of hiring workers. But um, this is a very unusual shock that's hit the economy. And at the same time, we see that um, a large number of workers um, have their participation in the labor force has declined, and it hasn't yet gotten back up to normal levels. In some cases, it's because there were early retirements, and of course, the pandemic did um, result in, unfortunately, a large death toll. But um, I think there is still many people who, um, especially low-income workers, 
who don't feel confident that um, about the health consequences of working, especially in face-to-face -face, um, type jobs. And so um, those people um, are still out of the labor force. And I think as the, um, we get greater control over the pandemic, the supply of workers will increase as those people come back to work. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is a ranking member of the committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chair Powell, the last time we were here, in fact, uh, both in September and July, I asked you about this. Uh, the Fed incorporates uh, new spending uh, from the fiscal house, from, from Congress uh, and the White House. Uh, they incorporate that into projections, right, in the, in the effects of your monetary decisions uh, with the knowns of fiscal policy. And at the time, you said this twice before, I think you'll say it again, but a lot depends on the details. Certainly you incorporate that information, but a lot depends on the details. Is that still true? Yes. Okay. Um, so in light of that, uh, we had in February a, a Democrat-only uh, proposal that, that made it into a law that spent $2 trillion. And then we have uh, just last week uh, another bill the administration supports um, that uh, enhances the deficit according to the Congressional Budget Office, uh, raises the deficit by $400 billion. Um, and, um, and so we have those two large fiscal pieces here. When Chair Waters asked, uh, Secretary Yellen, when Chair Waters asked uh, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve whether or not uh, spending more money from the fiscal house will improve inflation, I think what she asks instead of improve, I want to translate for the public, when a Democrat says improve inflation, it means enhance or raise inflation, just to be clear, okay? So my friends on the left it, when they say improve inflation, they want more of it. So, Secretary Yellen, to this point, now these things are imprecise, policy making is imprecise, but back in February, there was an output gap this administration acknowledged, right, in, in economic projections, and came to Congress for a fiscal stimulus in the name of COVID, but a fiscal stimulus, right? Is it fair to say that maybe you overshot in February? Well, I think it's fair to say that we had a sizable fiscal stimulus. We were very concerned that the most significant risk facing the American economy was a shortage of jobs and a prolonged downturn that would scar many people, particularly the most but in vulnerable. February, the, the, the output gap, right, versus what the fiscal stimulus was that you, that your administration pushed for and got, perhaps you overshot. Is that fair to say? Is that a fair assumption? Well, I, I, I don't think that's a fair assumption. It's not? So we, you, Jason we Furman what and was a very substantial risk and as Chair Powell just mentioned, the United States. Okay, so you, the you think that that fiscal stim reclaiming my time, Madam Chair. Now, look, the inflation. I'm ask a very particular question about the output gap. The output gap at the beginning of the year was three to four hundred billion dollars, right? Economists on the left and right were saying that that was about right. I, I think it was extremely hard under the circumstances. To have any okay. certainty, and I'm asking a very reasonable what question. Was, what as was a policymaker, okay. As a policymaker, I'm just asking you. You're you're a noted economist, right? Who's chaired the Federal Reserve? You're now in a very different position, having to, I think, sell what is a pretty lousy economic agenda. But you're doing a great job trying to sell this administration's agenda. The economic question that I hear from economists on the left now is that, and your former San Francisco Fed even acknowledges that that February stimulus contributed to the inflation we're now experiencing. Well, look, inflation- Is that a fair assumption look, or not? Inf inflation is a matter of demand and supply, and it's certainly true that the American Rescue Plan um, put money in people's pockets, helped them meet expenses that they had, and contributed to strong demand in the U.S. economy. 
but if you look at the amount of inflation that we have and its causes, that is um, at most a small contributor. The pandemic and what it's done to supply chains, diverting demand away from services and massively onto goods, which has resulted in supply chain problems and the impact we have seen that's now been long lasting on labor supply due to the pandemic. Um, I would say those are so, very important But there's a factors. distinction here between a supply shock and a demand issue, right? Is that fair to understand? The recovery plan did boost demand, and that's one reason that most households um, are in a favorable financial position, much better than they otherwise would have been, and it's enabled their spending. But the fact that the spending, because of the pandemic, has been so focused on goods as opposed to services has contributed massively to the supply chain problems okay. that are so, boosting prices. So, Madam Secretary, uh, Chairman Powell, um, the, the Congress and the public and this administration wants to point everything onto the Federal Reserve on inflation. That is simply not the case. It is the multiple trillions of dollars that this Congress and this administration is spending that's putting jet fuel on the fires of this economy. It is making things worse. Regular it is the policies order. of this administration. The chair went over time, and I'm going over time as well. So let me just say this. I was it is the administration's agenda Perry. here that it, I, will, I will finish my sentence here, Madam Chair, okay? It is the administration's agenda that is driving up the cost of things. It is making the American people worse off, not better off. Inflation is outpacing wage increases. This is on the Democrat House, Senate, and White House. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Good morning, and uh, thank you, too, for your service. I'm way over here today. A um, couple things. I, I'm listening to the publicans. Uh, talk about uh, inflation, but I think a uh, more important topic we should be talking about is the fact that since the ex-president Trump was defeated by Joe Biden in November of last year, uh, we've added almost 6 million jobs, some 620,000 jobs per month. And we've seen the stock market rise from 26,000 to 36,000, now it's backed off to about 35,000 in the last year at $1.4 billion per point. It's almost up $13 trillion since Joe Biden won the election last year. We've seen GDP up uh, dramatically over the last year. And my friends, I appreciate that the Republicans want to talk about inflation because that's all they can talk about. So I'd like to... Uh, Ask my first question of you, Secretary Yellen. Unemployment is falling at the fastest rate in 50 years and is now at 4.6%. Prior to the American Rescue Plan passing, the Congressional Budget Office projected it would take until the fourth quarter of 2023 to get to 4.6% unemployment. So we're two years ahead. Madam Secretary, my question is on Build Back Better. And how will it help in terms of the recovery and create more opportunities for everyday Americans? Well, thank you for that question. Build Back Better is really focused on addressing long-term issues in our economy that have been holding back economic growth and contributing to economic inequality. Um, an important aspect of Build Back Better is what it does for children and households with children. Two years of universal early childhood education for three and four year olds and subsidies for child care to make quality child care affordable um, for the great majority of households along with a continuation at least for a year of the child tax credit 
that has made it possible for so many families to um, support the needs of their children, keep roofs over their heads, and diminished food insecurity. And these child care provisions, as well as other um, parts of the program, should serve to boost labor force participation, particularly of women, where we've lagged behind most other developed countries. Um, and research suggests that our failure to provide adequate child care and paid family leave is an important contributor. In addition, um, let me let me change the subject for one second. Just a subject that I've asked both of you about in the past: the Safe Banking Act, which involves uh, allowing financial institutions to provide financial services to the cannabis industry and those that serve the cannabis industry. And you may know that we added, we passed it with big bipartisan votes out of this committee, off the floor to the Senate last cycle. This cycle, it. We amended the National Defense Authorization Act. So that's just to remind you where we are. In October, uh, Cassidy Collins, a senior counsel in the office of the chief counsel of the IRS, noted the special type of collection challenge the IRS undertakes regarding tax collection from cannabis-related businesses forced to operate in cash only. It's estimated that in just three states, nearly $50 million in taxes went unassessed because of unique issues surrounding the cannabis industry. Madam Secretary, do you agree if these business were, businesses were simply allowed to access the banking system and didn't have to transact business only in cash, it would make the IRS's job easier? Yes, of course it would. I yield back. <laughs> The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Secretary Yellen and Chair Powell, thank you for joining us today. And as I expressed to you earlier, Chair Powell, I want to congratulate you again on your renomination for another term leading the Federal Reserve Board. And I look forward uh, to continuing to work with you. Chair Powell, you responded that our best expectation, this is your quote, our best expectation is there will be modest upward pressure on prices this year, but they won't be particularly large or persistent in the future. Chair Powell, since that hearing eight months ago, I have asked you about higher inflation, and yes, to my good friend, the gentleman from Colorado, we're going to talk about inflation. That's all that people are talking about in my district, Missouri's second congressional district. They want to know why these prices keep going higher and higher and higher and higher. And no, I don't believe it's, it's necessarily to fall at the, at the foot of the Fed blame. It is Democrat policies and <coughs> overspending. But I digress. I asked you about higher inflation two more times, sir, uh, and Americans have experienced surging increases in, as I said, food, fuel, housing, leading up to the most expensive Thanksgiving, Christmas, and holiday season on record. Is it your view, sir, that these price increases still aren't, quote, particularly large or persistent? No, that is no longer my view. Thank you for that answer. Chair Powell, yesterday in the Senate Banking Committee, you stated that you believe it's time to retire the word transitory. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and to explain more clearly what the Fed means when referring to transitory inflation. I think most Americans, sir, define transitory as temporary, but the strain on their monthly budgets and paychecks from this inflation does not seem transitory or temporary. If that's not what you mean, then could you explain the Fed's meaning, please? Sure. So the the word transitory, to some, as you suggest, has a, has a, a, a sense of short lived, a matter of months kind of thing. Whereas when we're we're using it in in a specific way to say that transitory to us means that that this this episode, however lengthy it is, will not leave a persistent long run uh, string of high inflation behind it. And the the problem, you know, our our whole uh, 
role that we play, it, it really revolves around having clear communication. When you have a word that means different things to different people, we just need to move on and find a better way to explain ourselves. And you know, most forecasters still do think, overwhelmingly believe that, that inflation will come down um, significantly in the, in the second half of next year. But as I've said, you know, the, the risks of higher inflation have, have moved up. I are more persistent. Is, is soaring ever. debt and deficits and, and excessive spending uh, and, and, and dumping uh, stimulus spending after stimulus spending after stimulus spending into our economy, will that be a driver of inflation? So I, I guess I would say I don't want to comment on, on you know, fiscal policy directly. I'm just saying in general. In, in general, so... If you go back to last March, the, the, the median of the blue chip, the best, best resourced forecasters thought that, that inflation would be right about at our target, March of, of this year. What was wrong with that analysis was really that we understood demand would be strong. We didn't understand how, how the, the significant problems of the supply side, which are very hard, they were unique. We and how much the money there would be uh, in, in households and in the... Uh, demand demand is very very strong, both from fiscal po from no question from fiscal policy and also from the, policy. the quickly rebounding economy. The economy is very strong now. I agree. I agree. So, um, Secretary Yellen, let me ask you: the CBO, and they reflect one of the more conservative scores, has said that Biden's spending bill, the most re recent one, will add three hundred and sixty-seven billion dollars to the deficit. Could you? describe the long-term consequences of too much fiscal spending on financial markets and the price of consumer goods. So um, let me first put the CBO number that you mentioned in perspective. They did score uh, Build Back Better as resulting in $367 yes. billion dollars in deficits over 10 years, not in a year, but over 10 years. Well, there were a lot of gimmicks that went through however, to, to get that number, too. Let's, however, the, be sco honest. the score, that score, they made clear, does not include the revenue that will come from enhancement of resources for tax enforcement. It doesn't include how, that. How does and this treasury, overspending uh, treasury, uh, on, on our financial markets and, and deal with expired. the price of consumer goods? I'd like the gentlelady to... to uh, gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas...